All day long, it has been absolutely nuclear in this place. God has been moving, and I want your expectation to be high for what God is about to do. Please understand that what God is about to do in this room is it is not uh, for our comfort and for ease, but it is for His glory. Now, you will get blessed. And you will benefit. But when God gets ready to do a miracle, he's doing it for his name's sake that he may get the glory through you in Jesus' name. Bishop Kevin Wallace is with us today all the way from Chattanooga. Chattanooga or Chattanooga. I don't know wherever you're from. I call it Chattanooga. And you know Nashville is my home. So we got a, a Tennessee in the house. How, how are all the Gator fans in here? None in this service. This, I knew this service was more saved. I knew it was. I knew it was. But there is some fresh oil about to get released in this house. Bishop Kevin Wallace is absolutely um, hands down. I said last service in my opinion, but I'm just going to state fact. One of the greatest voices in the world today, period, for a generation. Not just a preacher, but God has specifically put a mantle on his life for a generation, and he shall be a voice for this generation, to this generation, and shall lead us into great victory. And it is an honor to submit under the mantle that God has over his life. We thank God for him. But as great a preacher as he is, and I said I would say this all three services because it's what matters in this house. It matters. Integrity and character matter. Not just the gift. I don't want just the gift. I want somebody that's got oil that's dripping off of their gift. As, as great a preacher as he is, and I mean this like, I, you know, I've done this three times, and you have guest preachers, and there's always these introductions. It's always the part, Bishop, that, that I feel the most uncomfortable with, introductions. Like, just I'm just not good at them. I always felt like, man, I... I got, I, what, what do I talk about? And like, what do I say? Best-selling author and CEO and founder of and like all of these things. And I've never felt good at it. But I'll tell you that it's always been easy when you're here because it's easy to say that as great a preacher as you are, you are a better man. And who you are as a man of God, every time I've been around you, it has inspired me to be a better husband to be a better leader, a better pastor, a better shepherd. Every time I leave Ruach, I come up every single year. I've been coming for not nine years, n nine years, nine or ten years we've been coming. Uh, one year, I think, after Apostle Rayleigh came for the first time, so the year after that. We've been coming, and every year God has given us a prophetic word for this house that's been birthed at your conference. And what you don't realize is, is that when we were seemingly to the world nothing in a cafeteria with less than 100 people, Bishop Kevin Wallace would come and pour his heart out on our revival nights, and God would move in an incredible way. He loves his wife. He loves his family. And more importantly, he loves the presence of God. Will you put your hands together and thank God for the gift and the anointing on Bishop Wallace's life. Come on. Thank God with some expectation in the room. Amen. Clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God. Oh, that's an applause. I said clap your hands and act like every time you clap them together, another principality is getting destroyed. An another enemy is being defeated. Clap, clap, clap. It's not just a noise, it's an announcement. Woo! There's victory in this room. I don't want you just to clap. I want you to open up your mouth and put some air over your vocal cords and shout. Whether you feel like you got victory, act like you got it and shout for the voice of triumph. Hallelujah! This is service number three. And I got me some caffeine. They gave me a spark. I'm ready to go. I could storm hell with a water pistol right now. Run through a troop and leap over a wall. Hallelujah. How many are thankful? I love y'all. Y'all don't even know what I'm going to say, but you're already thankful. Let me tell this story while you're standing. I, I remember several years ago, I was at my home. It was midnight. It was January. 
It was the coldest night of the year. It was about midnight. I was getting ready to go in for the night and tuck in, and my doorbell rang at midnight. And they would say, who is here at midnight? I said, I don't know. So I went to the door, and there was a precious young lady on my front porch, seven degrees outside. Her face was bruised and blood was frozen to her cheek and mucus was frozen all over her face. She had on a pair of socks and a little light, thin t-shirt. And she looked at me and she said to me, sir, her head was down. She said, sir, can you help me and let me use your phone? I have been abused and I don't know where I am. And she said, I'm cold and I'm hurting. And I know this is weird, but can you and your wife let me have your phone to call someone to come and get me? And she had been beaten and sexually abused. And her head was down and she looked up. And I looked at her and I called her name. I went to high school with her. And she looked at me and she said, Kevin, is that you? And I said, it's me. She starts crying. She knows I'm a preacher. She watches on Facebook and I never knew it. She said, I'm so scared. God doesn't love me anymore. And I looked at her and I said, I'll call her Jennifer. That was not her name. But I said, Jennifer, I know he loves you. Out of all of the houses you could have walked up to on this mountain, you walked up on my front porch and you are going to come into our house. I made her some chicken noodle soup, gave her some hot tea and honey. We warmed her up. She made a phone call. I just want to tell somebody who wonders if God loves you. The fact that you walked into the, this house today. You could have been in any house, but the fact that you walked into this house today, if you've been wondering if God loves you, he loves us, oh, how he loves us, oh, how he loves us, oh. He loves. How many are thankful for his love in this room? Look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, he loves you. He loves you. And so you ought to be thankful you're in this house. You could have went to some old dead, dried up religious house, but how many are glad you're in a house where they're going to warm up your soul, heal all your wounds, bandage up all your cuts, I don't know what you're going to be, but I can praise God you are not what you used to be because of what God is doing in this room. Somebody give God some kind of praise. Oh, I know it's 1.30 and we all ought to be tired and somewhere else, but I'm in the church. I'm in the room. We ought to just, we ought to be thankful that we're here right now. Hallelujah. I want you to help me thank God for your pastors, these apostolic leaders. Somebody tell God thank you for Pastor Jeremy, Pastor Missy Dunn. Come on in here and give God some praise. Now that's an applause. I said you ought to praise God for the gift. Can you put my family's picture up there? I just want you to see how fine my wife is and how beautiful my children are. That on the left is Jeremiah. Next to him is my baby girl, Judah. In my lap is Isaac Asher Wallace. To his left is his mama, the queen of my hive, the jam in my jelly roll. I better quit. I get in the flesh. And in her lap is Judah Moriah. Uh, pardon me, Genesis, Amaya. And to her left and my right is Zion. And to her left and my right is my son, Isaiah. And those two babies in our lap in the last two and a half years have become part of our family through the blessing of adoption. 
I will not go into the whole story except to tell you I have preached my whole life for life. I have preached against injustice both in the streets and in the womb. We have paid a price for that position. Some people say, well, you're so political. It's a demonic assignment to address such a valuable issue to a political side. I don't have a side because my king don't live in Washington. My king sits on the throne. I wish I could find some help. I don't have a side. I'm on the Lord's side. But I will tell you this, the church has screamed against abortion but done nothing to deal with life. I can't find no help. If we're going to preach about life, we ought to have some adoption and we ought to have some love for life in the womb and in the streets. So we stand up against injustice of every kind. And we don't just preach against it, we do something about it. Because we're not just identifying the problem, we are a solution for the problem. And so we adopted. And what's amazing is the young lady that is in Devon's lap, that's Genesis. Her birth mother was a 14-year-old girl who got pregnant unwantedly, was a encouraged to have an abortion. She decided she would let the baby live, and that baby's sitting in Devon's lap. That 14, hold on, let me finish this story here. I want you to hear this. That 14-year-old girl that was the birth mother had a 28-year-old mama who was a prostitute. She had 10 abortions, nine abortions, and was about to have her 10th until her 14-year-old daughter looked her in the eye and said, if you'll have this child, I know a family that will take it. That 28-year-old mama came out of prostitution and out of drugs. We put her in a safe house for six months. She had Asher, who is actually Genesis' uncle, but by birth is now her brother, so we call him Bunkle. Bunkle Asher. What's the point? The point is we're the kingdom of God. Let's stop just identifying problems. Let's do something that makes a difference in the world. Come on, look at somebody tell them do something to make a difference. Y'all are in trouble. Because there is no countdown clock on the back wall in this service. And I'm going to haul off and preach and do whatever I want to do for the next whatever time I want to do it. I have lived in bondage for two services. I am about to burn this place straight down to the ground. How many are ready to burn it down with me? Somebody say amen. Look at your neighbor say, neighbor, if you want to leave like you came, you better get out of here real quick. Because everything in this room that has been tied up, bound up, and locked up is getting ready to get loosed over every one of you. In fact, everybody connected to you is getting ready to step out of darkness into the marvelous light. I declare what has been held back has not been kept from. It's been kept for you. And you're getting ready to step into a new season. Inform everybody on your row. This whole row is coming into breakthrough. This whole row. If you don't want to be blessed, you better get your stuff and move to the other side of the church. If you don't want to walk out of here the head and not to tell, you better get your belongings and run for the exit sign. Because before God gets through with this house, we are coming out of Egypt and we're crossing over in the promised land. Somebody say yay! Oh Lord! Hey. All right. I'm going to behave. Go to Acts 12, please. Acts 12, stay standing. If you're not standing, please stand for the reading of the word. If you can't stand because of physical ailments, lift your hands. We'll pray for healing. And believe God to heal your body. Amen? Amen. I, in every service I preach in, it's just been glorious. I'm kidding about the time. The Lord knows <laughs> I've been in bondage for two services. <laughs> that was a joke. We have not been in bondage. We have been in breakthrough. It's been glorious. I'm telling you, the Lord has just done a work in this place. This is, I don't get to go many places on Sunday. I do not go to many places on Sunday because I just have responsibility and I love my church. I love my people. But this is a house... Whenever your pastor calls me, if I can't at all be here, I come. Because there's something going on here that I just have always wanted to be a part of and have been a part of and will continue. 
by the grace of God to be a part of. And it's just been glorious today. And in every service, it's been different. Like a, the, the Holy Ghost would just illuminate and, and sort of just place his hand on a certain thing that he, he didn't in the previous service. And I just think that that may happen in this service as well. I believe God has something specific and he even began to mention it. And I just want to trust the Lord to speak to every heart in this place today. But I want you to go to uh, Acts chapter 12 and I want to uh, read the first 11 verses of Acts chapter 12. Uh, because how many would recognize with me we are living in a significant season? And we're living in a significant time. We'll talk about that in just a moment. I want to talk about this whole issue of the door. And uh, your pastor is going to come and go deeper with this over the next several days and weeks. Um, and I'm not going to get in his way. But I shared with him what I felt like God wanted me to share with you. And he said, go for it. Don't hold back. So that's what I'm going to do. You're going to hear him go deeper than I will be able to go today. But I just want you to recognize you are not living in a normal day. Or an insignificant season. These days are the days of revelation. And as my wife said in the women's conference this past week, we are living in an epic epoch. <laughs> epic, say epic epoch. Now, you may not know what an epoch is. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but it's something I had to go uh, sort of rediscover myself. But an epoch is when something begins to happen in the earth that changes the future and the trajectory. In other words, it sets sort of a new season in order. A new. It's not just like another day, but it's an. It's a different ep epoch. And Devin, the Lord spoke to her heart, and she said, and, and the Lord said to her heart, "It's going to be epic what I'm about to do in this new epoch." You say, "What is an epoch?" How many know 9/11? gave us a new epoch on the earth, right? How many would agree that COVID sort of shaped a new epoch? Well, I'm going to tell you, God is, God is about to change the epoch himself, and he's not going to allow the enemy to announce the new epoch. Heaven will be announcing a new epoch. And I just want to kind of announce to you the significance of the day that we're living. We, we're going to just teach this for a moment. We'll see where God takes us. This is such a beautiful congregation, and I... I Leaned over to your pastor. I said, this service feels to me like the one I used to preach in the afternoon uh, when I would go down. We had two services, and I went downtown into the inner city church. And in that church service on that Sunday afternoon service, there were so many people hungry for God, so many people coming and getting born again. I just feel that kind of kingdom breakthrough in this service. There is something significant about this 1230 service. How many are glad you're in this room? Somebody say amen. Let's go to verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested Peter, he put him in prison. And he delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Somebody say after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, when Herod was about to bring him out that night, when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping. This is interesting. He was bound by ch two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and said, Rise up, arise quickly, he said, and his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So when he went out and followed him, he did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. How many know it's amazing when God gives you that kind of season when something is really happening, but it seems too good to be true? Oh, come on, follow me right here. How many know we're going to step into something until it really hits us? We're not even going to be able to begin to believe it's happening, and one day it's going to settle on us. This is not a dream. This is really happening. How many know we serve a God that good? Somebody say amen. When, verse 10, when they passed the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Say its own accord. 
And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Verse 11, and I'm through. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for a certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod. Watch. And from all of the expectations of the Jews. Oh, yes. Look back up there. I keep keep thinking of how good that is, that last verse that God delivered him from the expectation of the Jewish people. How many know God's going to deliver you from the expectation of your enemies? But what I really want you to focus on, because I keep getting this as we keep preaching through this here, what I keep getting is that part where it said, and the gate of the city opened to them of its own accord. God is about to open some gates and some doors. I can't find no help in here. I said, God is going to open some gates and some doors. Yeah. Nudge your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, he's talking to me. He's talking to me. There's some, about to be some doors open in my life. If you believe it, give God a shout of praise and say amen. Yeah. Father, help us, bless us, keep us, protect us, lead us, guide us. Let a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus rest on this house. I pray the fire of God hit this place and people be catapulted from glory to glory, even by the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Um, I know now after being here, and I knew this before I got here, but I know now after being here um, why the Lord has allowed me the privilege of being connected to your amazing pastors and to this incredible house. Uh, it's, it's, it's because we have a like spirit. And there's, some, uh, there's some, uh, so many similarities in the assignment that God um, has given us, and there's so much uh, appreciation and honor for so many of the same things. One of those things that I feel in this house that has certainly been an earmark of what God has called Devin and I to do in Chattanooga is the honor and the esteem and the appreciation we have for the deep things of God and even for the kingdom of God. This house that you're sitting in is not just a church, it's a kingdom culture center where we literally see a demonstration of heaven on earth. This is why some churches are going out of business because they're in the business of church. But the church is not the end to it all. The church is the vehicle that pulls people into an understanding and a revelation of the kingdom of God. We are not here just to see big churches built. Big churches being built are a reminder that the kingdom is expanding. We do not want to come and celebrate what we're doing just in the church. The church has become a place where the kingdom can invade and the life of the kingdom can be demonstrated and the culture of the kingdom can be experienced. There's a reason you look forward to coming to church on Sunday. It's because when you walk through the door, you taste and see that the Lord is good. We got to quit, we got to quit getting people attached to our churches and we got to get people attached to the kingdom. If you ever get them attached to the church, then they might get attached to the preacher. If the preacher ever falls or the church ever falls, then they fall. But if you ever get them excited about the kingdom, people can do crazy things, but the kingdom of God shall stand forever. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but if it's attached to the kingdom and built around the king, it will stand. And there's this culture of the kingdom happening in this place. And one of the things that I am most interested in in this season that we are living is the calendar of the kingdom. Touch somebody, tell them the calendar of the kingdom. May I please suggest to you that the kingdom has a calendar. Now, the world you're living in has a calendar as well. Does anyone remember what the calendar of the world we're living in is called? It is called what? The Gregorian calendar. Come on, how many know what I'm telling you is the truth? Uh -huh. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, and we keep going. That calendar is a Gregorian calendar, but it is not God's calendar. God does have a calendar, and on that calendar, God sets seven different feasts that occur throughout the year. The year in the, in the life of a Hebrew is not built around January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. 
the kingdom of God life is built around the feast of the Lord. How many have ever heard of the feast, the seven feasts? Come on, lift your hands up if you know what I'm talking about. Passover, unleavened bread, feast of trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, uh, feast of weeks, feast of, feast of Pentecost. We could go through all of the feasts of the Lord, and you may say, well, I'm not really interested in that because that is a Jewish thing. No, it is not. A Jewish thing. They were never called the Feast of the Jews. They were called the Feast of the Lord. The Lord put those on, uh, uh, the Lord put his calendar on full display for his people. And we say spiritual things sometimes trying to be deep. We say things like God is not predictable when in reality God might be the most predictable person you've ever met. Because God is willing to put things on his kingdom calendar. Are you following me here? And it may not line up with the world's calendar around it. But how many know we are called not to synchronize our life with the calendar and the, and the, and the pattern of this world. We are in this world. Come on, family. But we are not of this world. Sometimes our life is dictated by the calendar we see. Let me go one step further. It's dictated by the watch you got on your hand. But I want to tell you right Right now, God says, I'm not operating on your time or your calendar because my kingdom is the one that I'm the king over. And aren't you thankful that God is able to work around the clock? Oh, come on here, catch this. He works around the clock. And we usually hear that phrase and we think, oh, he works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all that is true. But I want to tell you what I got a revelation of this weekend. He literally steps outside the clock and works around the clock. And somebody in here needs to thank God that even though the world you're living in may not think it's your time, I want to tell you God is not working on the time clock of this world. He is working on the calendar of his kingdom. And because you you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. Slap your neighbor, tell your neighbor, God is up to something in your life right now. Whether you feel like he is, whether it looks like he is, whether you act like he is, he is working. And let me help you, while you were sleeping last night, he was working for you. While you were snoring last night, angels were putting things in line for you. He that keepeth Bobby and Jim and Susie and Sally, he never sleeps, he never slumbers, he's working around the clock. So he has seven feasts, and we are in the midst of one of those feasts right now. Look at somebody tell them we're in a feast, we're in a feast, we're in a feast. We're in a very special time of the year. In fact, it started yesterday. It's happening today. It's called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh, everybody say Rosh. Hashanah. Rosh is the head or the crown and Hashanah is that concept of a year. So literally the moment that you're standing in on the calendar of God. You say, I, don't, I didn't hear about this last night because the world ain't going to tell you. The world don't know what time it is. The world drops a ball and throws balloons and has a party on January 1st, 2024. But they're six months late. Because the real new year begins today and yesterday. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all not hearing me. This is, see, see, and the resi and I'm not saying you're resisting it, but if there's any resistance in us to receive that, it is because our lives have been patterned after the pattern of the world, and we have ignored and missed and become ignorant to the fact that when we don't even understand it, God is up to something. This revelation is happening all across the earth now because as we approach the coming of the Lord, it is imperative that more revelation be released least so that more people come through the door of that revelation you can't sit in a dead dark room in this season you better find a church where the Holy Ghost is talking and people are hearing the word of the Lord I don't need a sermonette preached by a deaconette driving a corvette smoking a cigarette I need a prophetic word that will activate me and shift my life Now, I know I'm too much for some of y'all, but I'm leaving in a little while. And some of y'all are like, why is he so amped up? Why is he so? Because we got people coming to church who are sleeping through the next thing that God is doing. You cannot afford to miss this season. Your children cannot afford for you to miss this season. You got some grandchildren ain't even born yet that need you to step into this moment that we're living in because there's a shift happening. We are in Rosh Hashanah. It is a new year. Let me break down and tell you where we are. 
Uh, we were in five. We were in five seven eight three. Say five seven eight three. Five seven eight three. And last night at around sundown, we stepped into five seven eight four. And five seven eight four. I don't have time to break it down completely, but five is the number of the millennia. Five is the number of grace. Seven is the number of completion. Eight is the number of new beginnings, and four is the year of the door. So if you want me to tell you where we're at, we're living in grace. God is finishing what he started. It's a day, it's a decade of new seasons, and it is a year of the door. I did not say open doors. I'm going to have to help somebody in the room. We've been telling everybody, open doors, open doors, open doors, open doors, open doors. And we're all shouting over open doors. And you missed half the shout. Because Revelation chapter 3, Jesus speaking to the church at Philadelphia, the angel of the church at Philadelphia, he said to the church at Philadelphia, behold, I am the one who has the key of David and I will open doors that no man can shut. And we shout over that. But the next part is as significant. I will shut doors that no man can open and we've been shouting over open doors but somebody is about to break out in a hallelujah over a shut door why would we shout over a shut door let me tell you why we would shout over a shut door because when Egypt had Israel and God brought Israel out of Egypt the night that the Passover lamb blood was put over the door your Bible says that they came out of their house after the path after the death angel had passed over and they were still alive Moses gathered up Israel took them down to the Red Sea and the elders looked back and Pharaoh had chased them down to the Red Sea and they started murmuring and complaining against Moses and they said you brought us out of Egypt to kill us at the Red Sea and Moses looked up to God and God said don't listen to them put your rod out over the sea wait a minute it looked like a setup it looked like the enemy was going to kill them at the Red Sea but what God had done was bring Moses to a place where he could shut a door on his enemy and those children of God would never have to deal that's why God said these enemies you have seen you shall I'll see no more Woo. both now and forever slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor neighbor before he opens the door tell him this is a day God is about to shut some doors I don't know who I came to preach to but God is about to shut the door on some stuff that's been chasing you God is about to shut the door on some stuff that's been harassing you God is about to shut the door on some relationships that won't leave you alone if you won't take them out of your phone God is about to God is about to take them out all by himself. You don't need them where you're going. Slap your neighbor, tell them, shut it, shut it, shut it. Shut the door on depression. Shut the door on disease. Shut the door on what's been chasing you. It tried to steal your joy long enough. We're living in a season of a shut up. shut the door I don't know how your house works but in my house you can actually go in my house and leave one door open and walk to another door a front door and open it when you open that door if there was a little crack y'all know what I'm talking about if there was a little crack in that front door or that back door if you ever open the front door if you ever open one door that vacuum and that new air Lord I feel like preaching sucks that door shut somebody said what was that noise I just heard what is this preacher up here hollering for I am a noise I am a voice and the voice you are hearing is trying to tell you God is about to slam the door on your enemy you've been trying to shake it you've been trying to get rid of it you've been trying to get yourself delivered God is about to slam it but back to what you were saying and back to finishing what he started I had forgotten as I was preaching all this this morning that in Israel, you won't hear this over in the in in in, in American church because we got too many dry hides, too many religious people. 
But over in Israel, they're calling this, I'm getting ready to blow your mind. You're not going to believe this. They're calling it the year of the daughters. I'm walking around. It's my last time. I don't care if you like it or not. I'm walking. They're calling it the year of the daughter. And let me tell you why. Because in 5783, they called it the year of the patriarch. Who are the patriarchs? He is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Oh, but when we crossed out of 5783, we crossed into 578. Four. And in Israel, there are not three matriarchs. There are four. Sarah, Rachel, Leah, and Rebecca. They're calling it the year of the matriarchs. I am getting ready to preach. If I had time, I would take you to Esther chapter 4. Esther was brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. I'm getting ready to blow your mind. What's crazy is that Esther came from the lineage of Saul. And Haman came the li- from the lineage of Agag. Saul was supposed to kill Agag, but he let him live. But God raised up a daughter in the place of a king who would not not obey and the man couldn't get it done but God raised up his children he raised up his daughter and the I feel like preaching on Sunday afternoon I came to tell you sweet lady you are more than just another beautiful pastor's wife God raised you up to finish something that the enemy tried to do in your family in your past but the Holy Ghost told me to tell you the door is slamming shut it is the day of the Well, I don't believe in women preachers. I don't care what you believe in. I don't care what you believe in. This is not your church. This is not your kingdom. Well, women ought to keep silent in the church. That is not what Paul meant. If women are to be quiet in the church, we wouldn't have no singing. We wouldn't have no greeters. We wouldn't have no people in the parking lot. What he was not, that was not what he was talking about. That's why Joel said, sons and daughters shall prophesy. So you're in a house right now, and I came to tell every woman of God who feels called of God, the, the lid is being ripped off, and God is about to open you up and pour you out. It is a day of the mothers and the daughters. Somebody shout. Woo. Sit with me. Sit with me, please. So there in Revelation 8, he said, I'm going to shut a door. No man can open it. I'm going to open a door, and no man can shut it. I want to talk to you about the stewardship of doors. Because you must understand, God will open the door, but the door is only open for a season. There is this truth, and Leonard Ravenhill told us this, that the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of that opportunity. When God opens a door, you got to make up your mind, I'm going through. I remember when we were given the opportunity to purchase the downtown campus that we have now. A person called me one day. I think I've told this story. Perhaps I've told it here. I was standing in the Atlanta airport on a three-day fast. Someone had called me and said, have you heard that Highland Park Baptist Church is for sale? I didn't know it was for sale. It was the biggest church in Chattanooga. I drove past that church every day of my life as a baby and a child. My grandma, my grandma and grandpa lived just a few blocks from it. My house at one point in my life was just a few blocks blocks from the church. And it was the biggest campus in Chattanooga, and it had come for sale. It had, gr- it had died and, 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 and dwindled from 12,000 people to 130 people. It died a 31-year death. It was the saddest thing you've ever seen in your life. And they've got this massive building. You've been there. And, 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 and 130 people. And so it was for sale. And this man called me and he said, I want you to pray and ask God if he wants you to have it. Oh, for real? Well, that's all well and good, but I just built a campus in Ottawa and I said to him, I don't have the money to buy that campus. And he said, that's not what I asked you. 
okay, 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 so let me pray. <laughs> so I went on a three-day fast. I'm on a three-day fast, and I decided we are not going to buy this campus. It's just too big. I don't need that big campus. I don't want to be an albatross around my neck. That's literally what I said. I, I can't handle all this weight. It's too big for me. And I'm on the third day of a fast. I was preaching and coming home from a preaching engagement in, in Atlanta, Georgia airport, and I'm standing at a train station on the third day of a fast. Now, you get more spiritual on the third day of a fast, but not me. On the third day of a fast, a water-only fast, I'm hungry. Y'all talk in tongues on the third day. On the third day, I'm in the flesh. I'm all mad. Oh, I'm hateful. Oh, God, give me a hamburger. Give me a cracker. I'll take a grain of rice. Somebody do something for the... I'm, I'm just hungry, I'm tired, I done preached, I'm trying to get home, I'm stuck at the airport, and I'm on the third day of a fast asking God, do you want us to have this building? And I had not heard from God until that third day. I'm standing in the Atlanta airport at a train station listening for the voice of God, and it came through the train attendant's voice. We stand there, and the woman's voice came over, and it said this, careful, doors are closing and will not reopen. <laughs> Did I tell you this story? Oh, okay. You would know it if I told you. I dropped my bags in the Atlanta airport and started weeping, and my assistant Chris is on the train, and he's in the train, and I'm stuck out here. My bags are falling out. <laughs> and he looks at me and said, Bishop, what is wrong with you? I said, I just heard the Lord. He said, you did? What did he say? I said, Chris, the Holy Ghost just spoke through that train attendant's voice. He said, what train attendant? He didn't even hear it. Because sometimes a voice is speaking. But he wasn't talking to you, so you weren't listening to the voice. I feel like preaching right here. I feel like preaching right here. Some people in your life cannot understand why you are excited in this season. It is because they are not hearing what you've been hearing, and they can't possibly get excited about what you're excited about. I came to tell you, if they didn't hear it, it does not mean he did not say it. Look at your neighbor, tell a neighbor he wasn't talking to you. Oh, yeah, you don't understand why I'm praising him like this. He wasn't talking to you. You don't understand why I've been given sacrificially. He wasn't talking to you, but he's been talking to me. And if his word ever gets in your soul, it will give you faith for the impossible. So he said, what did the Lord say? I said, doors are closing and will not reopen. And he felt the power of God in that moment. I went the next day and toured that building. I called the man who called me. I said, I don't know what to do with this except tell you what God told me. He said, what did God tell you? I said, God told me this door would close and would never reopen and I have to run through it right now. But the problem is, I don't have no money. He said, I know you don't have no money. But God told me you were supposed to buy that building. I was just waiting on you to hear the same thing. I said, so what are you telling me? He said, go tell them. You will, now, this, our campus appraised for 11 million, this, this the worship center, appraised for $11 million. He said, go tell them you will offer them $2 million for the building. I said, okay. <laughs> but I don't have $2 million. And the bank ain't finna give me no money. We had borrowed money for the Udo. I don't have no money. He said, I know you don't have no money. But, but I do. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Some supernatural is fixing to happen for these people. Y'all about to step into some stuff that's going to blow your mind. I'm not just here talking about crazy stuff. Some of y'all are like, is he talking about money? No. I'm not asking for your money. I don't need no money. I didn't come from the, I came to tell you that the Holy Ghost is a, oh Shabbat. The Holy Ghost is aligning things for people who will do the will of the Lord in this hour. And some of you have been feeling some kind of way that God has been waking somebody up in the middle of the night. You feel pregnant with something in your spirit. What am I feeling? I don't have the money for it. I don't have the people. 
people for it. I don't know where it's going to come from. God told me to tell you the door is about to open. Shout like it's about to open for you. He said, you don't have it, but God told me to give it to you. I went into a negotiating room. I don't tell this story everywhere because some people can't handle it. You tell this story to some people, they're like, what did you do? You was, you was selling drugs or something for that kind of money. They didn't even know how to report it in the newspaper. When God did this miracle for us, people called our office and said, what did you do to get that building? Everybody wanted that building. I said, yeah, but God didn't want everybody to have that building. I wish you would slap somebody and tell them if it's yours, it's yours. If it's yours, it's yours. You need to stop worrying about somebody taking yours. They can't take your man, girl. They can't take your girl, brother. If it's yours, it's yours. Stop acting like the devil got more power than God. Stop worrying about your haters. Who cares about your haters? Your haters don't got the power to take your stuff. If it's yours, it's yours. Somebody shop. Somebody shout like it's yours. Somebody holler, it's mine. So, so I went in that room. I said, uh, I'm going to make y'all this offer. And they laughed at me. I said, you got 24 hours. Because the door is shutting and will not reopen. <laughs> 12 hours later, I get a phone call. There was more money for the building on the table. But they knew I was raised four blocks from that building. And I looked at them all when I walked in. I said, you could sell it to a real estate investor because that's what they were going to do. Or you could sell it to somebody who was born in this city came from this place and has come back to rebuild down the broken walls of Chattanooga. And 12 hours later, they called us. They said, well, take the offer. And to this day, that's 13, that's 2013, 11 years ago. When God opens the door, I ain't told that story to any other service today. But when God opens the door, you have to decide Am I going through that door? If you don't go through it and it closes, it's not that God don't love you and you won't go to heaven. It's that you will miss destiny. I feel the grace of God flowing in this room right now to tell somebody in the season of open doors, decide I'm not going to miss Look at your neighbor, tell them like you love them. Love them enough to tell them, don't miss your moment. So why did you read Acts chapter 12? I'm so glad you asked. Because Acts chapter 12 is full of open doors. And I am, I am almost embarrassed to preach Acts chapter 12 when I've been talking about new seasons and new years and we're all in a new year. And everybody's throwing balloons and we're all excited and open doors are coming and shut doors on our enemy and we start Acts chapter 12 with harassment. The devil will always harass those who are next. And here's what's crazy. The enemy wants you to think you're next on his list. Talk to me, Peter. They done killed James, and they put you in prison to kill you tomorrow. And the enemy saying, see, I got you, Peter. You're next on the devil's hit list. But I need to tell you the devil is a liar. You are not next on his list. You are next on the Lord's list. If you could see what God was getting ready to do, you would absolutely not be afraid of your tomorrow. The enemy wants you to be afraid of tomorrow. But if you could see what God was up to in your life, you would put a hop in your feet and a shout on your lips and you would clap your hands like you didn't care what anybody thought about it. Because when you understand you are next, oh God, I better quit. I better quit preaching because I feel like something is about to blow up in this place. I feel like God is about to set the captive free and to lose somebody into their 
destiny. Slap somebody, tell them you're next, you're next, you're next. You are not next to die. You are not next for COVID. You are not next to be fired. You are not next for bankruptcy. You are not next. You are next for blessing. You are next for abundance. You are next for healing. You are next for breakthrough. You are next. The door is about to open for you. You are next. Slap three people in your zip code and tell them next, 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 next. Some of y'all need to get interested in this. Somebody needs to get interested in this. Somebody needs to get more interested in this. You need to praise God like you're next. Oh my God, I better quit it because I feel like preaching here. God is about to make you next. God is about to touch your life. Break every, break every curse. Break every curse. Open every door, heal every sickness, shake your neighbor, rock your neighbor, shake them and rock them, rock them and shake them, tell them you're next, you're next. I don't know what the devil's been telling you, but the Lord want me to tell somebody you are next, you are next, your house is next. Your marriage is next. Your ministry is next. Your business is next. The devil wants you to think you're getting ready to die. But it ain't dying time. It's living time. Somebody get a I shall live kind of praise in your mouth. How? Take a 20 second praise break. Just thank him that he loved you enough to make you next. Thank him that he loved you enough to keep you alive. Thank him that he preserved you through the test and the trial. You're next. Woo. Watch this. Watch this. And I'm through here. But the Bible said that they put Peter in prison. And uh, they intended to kill him the next morning. But they couldn't kill him that day because it was Passover. And Herod knew if they killed Peter on Passover, he would start a riot and a war in the city. So he put him in jail and intended. Your Bible said that Herod intended to kill him. How many know the devil got some intentions for your life? But he couldn't kill him because it was Passover. And you know what Passover is. Passover is that feast that they celebrated in Israel when they remembered the blood of the lamb that made the death angel Passover. I'm feeling a little tired here, so somebody going to have to pull on me by faith. Oh, I feel like preaching now. I feel like preaching now. The Bible said he's in prison, and they would have killed him, but it was Passover time. So quite literally, Peter is being kept alive because of the blood of Passover. Oh, I wish I felt like preaching here. Look at your neighbor. Tell him, neighbor, the devil would have killed you. But the blood made him pass over. It's Passover season. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I just came to announce that the blood has made your enemy pass over. The blood has made your adversary pass over. It's not that the devil didn't want to take you out. It's that when he got to your prison cell, he couldn't take you out because, oh, because of the Passover. I wish somebody would praise God. I better quit. Oh, Lord, I feel like preaching because the blood made the devil pass over. You should have died in the car wreck, but the death angel had to pass over. You should have overdosed on methamphetamines, but the devil had to pass over. Somebody shout for the blood of the Lamb. Somebody praise God for the blood. I know we praise him for new houses and new watches and new cars, but I'm still thankful that nothing but the blood of Jesus can wash away my sin. Somebody give God praise. Watch this. Watch this. I'm through almost. Watch this. Watch this. Sit down. Let me finish this message. Watch this. Bring me a chair, please. Bring me a chair out here real quick. Let me see the chair. And he is on death row. He is dying in 10 hours. And 
what is he doing? Sleeping. If I'm on death row, I'm hollering. Y'all know, y'all know y'all talking. If you're going to die in the morning, you are hollering. <laughs> he's on death row and he's sleeping. And I started reading behind all of these historians and theologians and scriptorians. Why was he sleeping? And they all had some crazy idea. He was tired. Yeah, he was tired. <laughs> but if I'm finna die, I don't care if I'm tired. My adrenaline's pumping. I'm screaming. He ain't screaming. And I, I read to see, why do they think he was sleeping? And one of them suggested he was sleeping because he was tired. And another one suggested, and this is a good idea, he was sleeping because he had been delivered before. And he knew God could do it again. What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? I'm talking about that night he got in a boat. He got out in a boat. Peter got out in a boat with Jesus in the middle of the lake and a storm broke out on the middle of the lake in the boat. The waves were beating in the ship and everybody said we're going to die. Somebody go wake up Jesus. Somebody go do what? Wake up Jesus. Well, why would they wake him up? Because he was sleeping. How do you sleep in a storm? You sleep in a storm when the peace in you is greater than the storm. They find no help. Lord, I better quit because if I had time, I would tell you that if you really know Jehovah Shalom, there's a peace going on inside of you greater than the turbulence that's going on around you. And the reason Jesus could sleep when the boat was sinking is because the peace inside him was greater than the storm going on around him. Oh, look at your neighbor, tell him you will not lose your mind. You will not suffer from depression. I rebuke the spirit of depression off of you. If you got it, may the peace of God invade your soul right now and may the peace in you be greater than the storm. Peter was on the boat that night and he saw Jesus sleeping in the storm. And he said, if Jesus can sleep in the storm, so can I. But that ain't why. That ain't why he slept. I found the reason why he slept. It's over in John 21, verse number 8. Peter is sitting by a campfire with Jesus. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, one day when you are old, you will die. And Peter's sitting up on death row. And he looks at himself and remembers the word of the Lord. And you know what he said? I ain't old yet. Touch your neighbor, tell them I ain't old yet. You got too much living to do to be thinking about dying right now. You got too much future to think about quitting now. Slap your neighbor, tell them live, 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 live. I'm going to come over here and preach real quick. Grab your neighbor, shake them like you're going to shake their hand off and say, live, 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 live. Live, 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 live. Live, 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 live. I rebuke the spirit of death off of you. I declare you shall live. You, who, you shall not die. You will declare the works of the Lord. You got too much living to do. Shake hands with four neighbors because it's five, seven, eight, four. Tell them you got too much living to do. I don't know what the devil's been telling you, but the devil is a liar. You got too much living to do. You got too much future. You got too much potential. You got too much tomorrow. Somebody say live, 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 live. Live, 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 live. Live, 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 live. Somebody get up on your feet and shout! Shout like you're gonna live. Praise like you're gonna live. Rest like you're gonna live. Bless him like you know you got a future. Thank God that no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. Live, 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 live. Somebody let 
somebody get down in your feet. Somebody let it get down in your feet and leap for joy. Leap for joy. Leap for joy. Leap, leap, leap. Live, live, live. Hey! Every generation of assignment against you is broken right now in the name of Jesus. went to sleep because he wasn't old yet and he's sleeping I'm almost through Woo. he went to sleep and an angel popped in the room and Peter was so at rest he slept through the arrival of the angel and the angel popped him on the side get up put your clothes on because we can't have no naked apostles running through the streets. Watch this, watch this. And the Bible said, the chains on his arms fell off. And I just, come here, Pastor Gerard. Come here, Pastor Gerard. Hop up here with me real quick. Watch this. I just caught this while I was reading the text. In this season, God's taking us into those that have had you chained up. God's about to set you free from who's been holding you back. Look at your neighbor, tell them, let it go. Come on, like Anna told Elsa, let it go. You got to learn how to release them. Some of you are holding on to relationships and people who have got you in a prison and paralyzed you in your journey, and they like you being chained up, and they like you being broke, busted, and disgusted, but I dare you to tell three people in your zip code, let them go. God is about to break into your prison and set you free from some people who've been holding you back from your destiny. I don't know who I came to preach to, but God is about to break the chains. Soul ties are breaking right now in the name of Jesus. And he, he gets free and he comes out of prison, passes the first group. Ward, stand with me, I'm through preaching. He passes the second ward, and he gets to the gate that leads to the city. And the Bible said that door opened up on its own accord. And I looked at that phrase, opened on its own accord. I looked at it in the Greek, and in the Greek, let me teach you some Greek real quick. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to class, we're going to class, we're going to class. That one phrase is one word in the Greek. It's a verb, and it is the verb automatos. Automatos. Does it sound familiar to you? It's where we get the English word automatic. Watch this, watch this. Somebody open that door right over there for me. Please, please just push that door open. Push it, sister. It'll open, I promise. Somebody push that door open right there. That exit sign right there. Come on, somebody push that door. Somebody push that door open right back there, sir, with the orange hat on. Yes, sir. Somebody push that. So watch this. Those do watch, 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 watch. Listen, listen, listen. Don't miss it. Those doors opened because somebody pushed them. That's where some of y'all been living. You've been having to push your door open. But let me tell you about this season we're getting ready to step into. There are, there are seasons you can enter where you, where you experience what you experience when you walk up to Walmart. When you go to Walmart, you don't push a door open. All you got to do is step in the right place. I gotta go back to Chattanooga. I feel like eating some Mexican before I leave. But before I go to lunch, I want you to reach over and tell somebody that door is waiting on you to get to the right place. If you will just step in the right place, uh -huh, there is a sensor over that door. It knows when you get there. And if you just get to the right place, the door is gonna open automatically. Slap three people, tell them automatically. Automatically in your business. Automatically in your church. Automatically in your marriage. Automatically for your children. Automatically for your grandchildren. You've been wanting the door to open, trying to push on it. But all you got to do in this next season is get in the right place. And the door is going to open. 
Look at your neighbor, tell them, get there, 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 get there. You've been trying to worry about how you're going to get through the door. You're not going to have to worry about getting through the door. All you got to do is get there and the door is about to open. going to open it's going to open in this season it's going to open and no power and no principality and nothing in your past and no hater eating hater rate and hater chips and hater tots as your apostle said, it don't matter what they hate on you. God's going to prepare a table before you. If I'm preaching to you and you know you're entering a new year and you're synchronizing your life to the calendar of God, Lift your hands all over this room right now. Jesus. Yeah, that's right, Joseph. Holy Ghost. I'm asking you right now. In this house, this third service, start opening. Start shutting. I prophetically decree and declare that the blessing of God is coming on them and their house. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. You will not die in that prison. You will not die in that prison. You're coming out not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Reach over, grab your neighbor by the hand right now. Please grab your neighbor by the hand right now. I want you to squeeze hope Gently squeeze hope and squeeze life into that hand right now. Father, come on, let's pray for one another. Father, in the name of Jesus, somebody came in here, they felt like fainting, but they're going to leave fighting again. Somebody felt like quitting, but somebody's about to step into harvest. I rebuke the lie of the enemy off their mind today. Somebody felt like they were coming to an end, but I thank you that it's just really a new beginning. It's just really a new beginning. Lord, I decree over this house expansion is in its future. Land acquisitions, properties, campuses increase. 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 And this is not going to be more sweat. <clears throat> yeah. This is not going to be more sweat. This is not harder working. It's actually less work and more fruit. Yeah. I feel like some people need to be told that because when you start thinking about expansion, you start thinking, I can't handle no more. God told me to tell you, you don't have to handle anymore. Put it on him and he'll handle it. He's going to give you the strategy to sweat less and produce more. Holy Ghost, do that, do that, do that, do that. Breathe on it, breathe on it, breathe on it, breathe. Let this house be a house like Antioch where it's not measured by how many we keep, but it's measured by what we send. Jesus, I said something right there. Father, I thank you for the explosion of growth, and it will continue to grow. But the Spirit of the Lord says you will not be measured just by how many you keep in your growth, but this house has measured its 
it's measured its success by how many and what it sends. And this is a sending place. It's an expanding place. Doors are going to open. And I feel in my heart in the next 12 months from this day forward, the supernatural is going to unfold. Don't let it shock you. Be thankful in everything. Recognize it was the Lord that's doing it. His kingdom is forcefully advancing. The righteous take it. The violent take it. The hungry take it by force. Squeeze that hand one more time. And as you squeeze it, let it be a reminder as you feel your neighbor squeeze in your hand. It's time to walk through open doors. When God opens doors, we're not going to cry over shut doors no more. If he shut it, it's because something is more significant is on the way. And we say yes. We say yes. I pray for some single parent mamas in this room that have been broken hearted. They've been just trying to make ends meet and the enemy's got her thinking she's doing nothing and, and what she's doing is insignificant. But I break that lie over you, sweet mama. You are raising world changers in that house. I want to tell you this, this, this room, this ministry, this church is up under you. You will not carry that burden alone. You will not bear that all by yourself. This is a kingdom center. Every child connected to this church is going to shake their generation in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to go take my seat. But the Holy Spirit said, I feel like the Lord said to me, tell them they are a prescription for the sickness in America. And America is being torn apart by spirits of division and malice and hate and racism. And the Spirit of the Lord said, I'm putting a prescription and I'm putting a bomb in this house. A bomb, B-A-L-M. A bomb of Gilead. A bomb of healing. Healing for the generations, healing for the races, healing for the cultures. Let me explain something to you. Why would Revelation talk about, listen, the leaves on the trees bringing healing to the nations when in heaven there will be no need? For national healing. Why would God say that then? I believe it's because in the nasty now, there are those people who can taste the world that is to come. Grab healing from that world. Bring it back into the messed up world we live. And let them taste the healing glory of the kingdom of God. How many believe God wants to put those kinds of leaves and fruit and healing in this house? Lift your hands up while your pastor comes. I bless you now. I bless you now with shut doors. I bless you now with open doors. What has been in lack will now come in abundance. What has been in measure will now come without measure. May the spirit of the living God rest upon you. And may you get to the right place and doors begin to open automatically for you in your life. Lift your hands, open your mouth, and for the next 20 seconds, worship him for who he is. For who he is. For who he is. Not for what he's given you, but for who he is. Somebody thank him that he's that good. Come on, let's praise him.